Okay, I think we'll uh, get going. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Kent Ford. I'm the host today for Green Business Roundtable. And uh, we're delighted to have you here. It's uh, um, gonna be a really fascinating topic. I think we've got a couple of great presenters lined up uh, for our discussion today. Um, let's see here. Uh, what do I invite you to say hello in the chat, introduce yourself in the chat. Um, stay muted until our question and answer period towards the very end. If you do have a question at the end, uh, send me a note, that'd be great. And uh, if you have technical issues, um, send a little note to tech support, either Susan or Sandia, and they'll help you uh, with Zoom or any other little technical issues, or if you see something pop up, that'd be great. Um, those of you who are not familiar with Green Business Roundtable, GBR is a platform to inspire, educate, improve, and network the business community on sustainability issues. And our parent organization is the San Juan Citizens Alliance, and they provide all the logistical support to make this happen. And I'd encourage you to give locally, become a member, as SJCA is our local leader for clean energy work, clean air, clean water, and protected areas. So thanks for San Juan Citizens Alliance for making it happen. I think we're, boy, 20 years, something like that of GBR, pretty awesome. I wanna thank uh, today's GBR sponsor, First Southwest Bank. And uh, they invite you to go green with their on-bill financing for solar and energy efficiency. And you can learn more and apply at fswb.bank slash go green. Really impressive programs they've got. And they also mentioned they've got um, free uh, EV chargers in Alamosa, if you're headed through that way. Um, as I mentioned uh, just a little bit ago, uh, this is the last GBR for the spring season. We'll be starting up again in September with the second Wednesday through the uh, fall and winter. Um, the venue to be decided, hopefully we're in person by then. Uh, very plausibly at the straighter again, we'll see. Um, but if you have ideas for topics and speakers, uh, we'd sure like to know them. Uh, contact Susan, sanwantsusans.org or myself, wkentford at gmail. And I'll tell you, lots of people suggest topics, but the hard part is finding a speaker and finding a speaker who has a uh, quality reputation of having a, a good presence in, to a large group. So uh, let us know if you know of uh, um, particular speakers who may be of interest. We'd love to hear it. So on to today's GBR, our guest speaker today, Adam Maxwell from eSource, and then he'll be followed by local updates, uh, the EV re readiness plan that the city of Durango and La Plata Electric have put together. And then we'll have a regional update from Fourcore. So uh, those updates will be sort of towards the tail end and then we'll have a wrap up, a couple questions, any announcements, send me a note. And uh, then at the very end, an optional small group discussion, we'll close it out by one o'clock on our strict timetable. Our topic today, overcoming the key barriers to EV adoption in Colorado. And we wanna give a special welcome to Adam Maxwell. He's our guest speaker today. He's the managing director for eSource, which is a national research consulting and data science firm with a focus on human behaviors and design thinking. eSource was founded in 1986 by RMI, Rocky Mountain Institute. Those founders, uh, Amory and Hunter Lovins, and their goal is partnering with utilities to help their customers save electricity. So Adam, welcome. We're delighted you're here and uh, you can take over the screen share or just right. uh, start talking. Thank you so much, Kent, for the introduction and for uh, having me here and allowing me to share some of our research. So uh, let me just make sure I get this into presentation mode. Yeah, so uh, appreciate the introduction. And again, eSource is a company, we're Colorado based. We work with utility companies across the country, um, about 80% of the power supply in the US actually. And a lot of what we do is around clean energy research um, and how consumers sort of be, perceive, behave, uh, what they're looking for and, what, and how utilities might be able to kind of close that gap and help deliver more clean energy to their customers. What I'm gonna talk about today actually is a very interesting project that we did with the Colorado Energy Office 
to um, better understand sort of the state of being of Colorado's electric vehicle awareness and knowledge so that we could help overcome some of these barriers to people getting EVs and uh, increase EV adoption across the state. So for the agenda today, um, I'm just gonna do a quick introduction of the project background and then get into some of our key market research discoveries and then sort of move into a little bit more to how do, how do we actually get to increasing EV adoption in Colorado? And uh, one of the ways to do so is through targeting these uh, Colorado EV consumer segments that we identified through this study. So I'm gonna be burning through some slides here. I'm, I'm hopeful that some of what I'm gonna be talking about today will resonate with those that uh, joined and say they are either EV owners and or interested in getting an EV. And I am in the uh, squarely interested space. I will be getting one as soon as my current car with uh, 250,000 miles on it dies, uh, which is very near around the corner. So let me just make sure I can see the whole screen here. So the whole premise of this project with the Colorado Energy Office, um, they, they are the owners of this project. We, we thoroughly appreciate uh, the opportunity for the project to do with them. We did it in 2020. The, the sort of foundational question, how might we accelerate EV adoption in Colorado to put nearly a million EVs on the road by 2030 with the benefits of improving local air quality, the global environment, financial benefits to drivers, and of course, uh, from our perspective, of course, in enhancing electric grid efficiency. So as you may or may not know, the Energy Office does have a goal of about a million EVs by 2030 on the road. And that is an ambitious, ambitious goal with the state of where we are right now. So with that context, um, we did a whole bunch of stuff within this project. A big nationwide literature review. Uh, we interviewed EV leaders across North America from utilities and nonprofits, you know, the, the Electrify Americas of the world. Um, we developed a framework to measure how we can actually determine whether EV awareness is changing in Colorado over time. And uh, the bulk of what I'm gonna be talking about today is, is this aspect here. We did a really in-depth quantitative market research study of Coloradans to better understand just their EV beliefs and fears and barriers and, and where they're lacking information and what might help them to learn more and, and able to, in order to better enable them to um, feel good about purchasing an electric vehicle. And so from that, we also developed a uh, consumer, Colorado consumer segmentation model, which I'll discuss a little bit today, and an EV adoption journey map to help smooth out some of those potential bumps where somebody might be interested in getting an electric vehicle, but then falls off for some unexpected or unforeseen reason. So with that project background in mind, I will start with some of the, with the five key market research discoveries from this project. And again, the, the quantitative study, we were really trying to get a handle on just what people in Colorado know about electric vehicles across the state. Um, what challenges do they see in, in buying one? You know, is it just model awareness or are there some other kind of underlying issues is, that, that might be at play that are really just not preventing people from taking, taking the dive and, and going for it? So first and foremost, number one across all of the study, that we, the, the number one thing we found out is there are so many charging misperceptions out there. And a lot of these barriers and misperceptions are actually due to a lack of information. So there's this underlying fear that people are overly concerned they'll run out of charge. Just a, a key question we asked in this is, um, you know, what are some of the top barriers to getting an electric vehicle? A lot of people said, I'm just concerned I'll run out of charge before I reach my destination. And so we wanted to dig into that a little bit. Like, why is that the case? And, and not just saying it's range anxiety, which is an easy kind of default thing to um, fall back to. So what we dug into a little bit was that 80% of Coloradans drive their primary vehicle 30 miles or less per day, yet they're concerned they'll run out of charge before getting to their destination. So this is a little bit of an unfounded fear and one that people just don't know. Charging your car at home using a regular three-prong outlet overnight, that'll get you about 30 miles of charge per day. You don't even need anything special to enable that to happen. So really forcing people to think about their driving habits in the context of charging an electric vehicle. We also found about 70% of potential EV adopters don't think they can charge at home unless they have special charging equipment. 
So people don't know that you can use a regular three prong outlet and get again, you know, give or take 30 miles of charge overnight, which meets 80% of Colorado's driving needs. And again, 66% um, are concerned they're gonna run out of power before reaching their destination. So that I think speaks to not understanding you can charge at home and also not understanding that there are chargers across the state that they can leverage out in public um, if they have that need. So it's this kind of, th this whole notion of charging is just a big mystery to people in Colorado. And it's something that um, we maybe have not been doing a great job as an industry helping to illuminate this very different than filling up your car with gas. Some of the nuances uh, with charging, you know, be, because of that, as I just mentioned, it, it is we, we really need to change that discussion about charging in Colorado. Um, people don't know, again, they, they don't know you can charge at home using a three prong outlet. They oftentimes don't know you can install a level two charger or, you know, a special faster charger at home. And they don't know where charging public charging stations are or how they even function. So there's this kind of almost innate fear of, how do I find this public charging station? And then, you know, what if I look ridiculous trying to go figure out how to use it and plug my car in and I don't know how to do it? So there's this, there's this kind of underlying belief, again, that charging's complex and it's really mysterious and, and it's something they just don't quite get because we have this sort of mental model around the gas vehicle ecosystem. Uh, and, and to illuminate this, this fact, 54% um, of respondents claim the following statement was false, that you can charge an electric vehicle at home by plugging it into a regular standard three-prong wall outlet. So over half of Coloradans don't think that you can do that at home. So again, we, we have a bit of a, a, a charging messaging challenge in the state. Second is that um, EV prices are a bit too high. Um, people think that EVs are, are too costly to buy for them um, on their own right now. Um, but what we found in the study is that people just don't know about tax credits. So over or, or only 45% of Coloradans are aware of federal tax credits, which are up to 7,500 bucks. And only 22% of Coloradans are aware of Colorado state tax credits of up to $2,500. And even people that are aware there are tax credits out there, we ask them um, what dollar amount they think they are. And you can see here, it's really all over the map. And, and a lot of people, a lot of respondents think that the overall dollar amount is actually a lot less than it is. So again, there's a big educational opportunity here to highlight these tax credits and how they can bring down the cost of an electric vehicle to about on par with that of a new uh, gas vehicle. There we go. Another really interesting finding here was that, um, let me just try to hide something here. Uh, that's much better. Okay, another interesting find here is that uh, we almost 50% of Coloradans want, self-proclaimed to want an EV within the next five years. Um, that's really interesting, that's really ambitious. You know, That gives a lot of optimism and hope that maybe that is an achievable thing. If we wanna get people to uh, act, there, people are already kind of leaning in that direction a little bit. So people are open, open to purchasing it, but they just don't quite know how to do it, how to get there. And, and there's barriers sort of thrown up all on the way, whether it's charging, whether it's financial, whether it's dealerships not having cars or even knowing how to find a dealership with an electric vehicle. Um, but there are there, there is interest out there across the state, which is really encouraging and great to see. Uh, number four finding is that uh, there really is a very strong response to environmental messaging across the state, which uh, we weren't actually entirely sure that we would see or not. And I know that some EV organizations have actually tried to shy away from the environmental messaging here. But what we have found is these types of messages resonate really well. Um, over 80% of consumers in one of the early stage segments here, which we call the ready to roll segment. And I'll get into what, what these different segments are and, and sort of who comprises them in a bit here, um, really react positively to messages such as contributing to better air quality in Colorado, reduce our country's dependency on foreign oil, preserving our environment for future generations, reducing carbon emissions and mitigating the impacts of climate change. And so this is the, positivity seen from a very near-term 
uh, EV consumer segment that is looking to get an electric vehicle. And when you take this out to Colorado as a whole, and there are plenty of people that aren't going to be getting one in the near term, um, th these numbers are still all over 60%. So uh, the response to these environment environmental messages is quite strong. Our finding number five here is that plug-in hybrids might have an important role to play. Um, you know, the, and this is versus a pure battery electric only. Um, these do match a lot of the needs that people have today and address a lot of the barriers and concerns that people have too. You know, they do eliminate that fear of running out of charge uh, because they can go on electric for a long time and then have uh, a very long distance on gas as well. And for most of those shorter trips, you know, 30 miles or less type of trips, um, you can typically make many of those trips on battery only. So they do, they might play that sort of important role in the near term as a bridge to more battery specific uh, in battery electric vehicle only uh, cars. So with those key, those key findings, and again, that, that's a very high level overview of a, just a ton of the market research that we have and, and uh, went through, uh, but some of the more important ones there, um, what we did with these findings is develop an education, an EV education and awareness roadmap for the Colorado Energy Office to give them a path forward to address some of these barriers in the marketplace to motivate people to purchase an EV using aspirational messaging and social norming, um, and to really try to increase the timeline into which people are gonna purchase electric vehicles. So these are a few of the stages in the electric vehicle uh, journey here, uh, awareness, consideration, and evaluation of electric vehicles. And so in the awareness phase, you know, this is kind of how people just become aware of an EV. And it's oftentimes these ambient triggers that can be emotional. So some of the goals that we recommended to the state are to really instill that belief that charging is easy and available, um, to hit that barrier about sort of misperceptions on charging, to promote the Colorado EV tax credit as a very nice benefit to purchasing one, um, promoting EVs as a lifestyle to fit Coloradans. And that's a really important type of messaging. People need to see themselves in an EV fitting sort of their day-to-day -day in their life in an aspirational kind of way that will really say, oh yeah, I, I, could, I could see myself in one of those, that makes sense. And really hitting on the environmental benefits too, you know, that are clearly resonated quite well. And when people are more in the consideration phase of an EV, so you know you become aware of it through whatever mechanism that might be, and it moves you to actually thinking about buying one soon, you have to see if it's worthwhile for you. You know, is it emotional and pragmatic? So something that we recommend doing is um, demonstrating how to charge at home and using a three-prong outlet because that does meet the majority of people's daily driving needs. Um, highlighting different EV models, particularly as more are coming into the marketplace in the very near term here. And also prov providing advice on, you know, whether a battery EV or plug-in or an internal combustion engine is right for various, you know, what types of use cases these are uh, most appropriate for. And then we move into other elements too about how to determine which EV is best for people. Um, but I I'll sort of leave that alone at the time being because we're, um, focusing more on sort of the overcoming obstacles to EV adoption here. So with all of that, how do we get there? How do we get to a million EVs on the road, factoring in all these kind of nuances and complexities of uh, EVs and the EV ecosystem in Colorado's minds? Well, the first and foremost, I, I, I pull this slide up here. Um, this is the, the diffusion of innovation, which is a model that all technology goes through uh, as it becomes adopted by different types of people. Um, and, and every technology goes through this. this. This actually, Jeffrey Moore created this, I think in the 1950s, and it still holds true today. Um, but essentially, you know, you kind of go from the innovators, people who are um, tech oriented, they love being first, they're really risk tolerant. Then you move into the early adopters and more people um, buy these new technologies. They're still trendsetters and adventurous, but they're not quite willing to tinker as much as the innovators. And if you don't get these people to adopt first, technologies just hit this chasm and they drop and, and they fall off so they fall off the face of the planet and they fall off people's radars and, and they're gone. And so what we need to do is make sure that we can get these innovators and early adopters in EVs 
um, promoting the benefits and demonstrating you know, the ease of charging the Colorado lifestyle so that we can actually move into the early majority and late majority of um, the consumer, the Colorado consumer segment. And I bring this up because right now, um, this is kind of where Colorado is currently in the, in the two and a half to 4% range or so of EV penetration across the straight, uh, across, across the state. And um, this is, you know, roughly the tra trajectory if we stay on that pace of getting to the early majority, late majority at, at a far later time frame, um, you know, like mid to late 2030s um, versus really accelerating this. And so what we need to do is kind of move this adoption curve much earlier and uh, spark this early market to make EV purchases at a far more rapid pace than they would otherwise. The way to do that is actually through very targeted segmentation of the Colorado consumer market. And um, that was a big element of our market research project was really looking at the different uh, attitudes and characteristics of study participants to be able to develop um, Colorado consumer segments that um, are sort of uh, give us a clear path forward of who we should be targeting with the right messages um, with the right advice and at the right time through the right channels so that we can really try to move that early stage market. Um, so a, a little bit more data here that fed into our Colorado consumer segmentation model is we're looking at when people are gonna buy their next car and their, next e their first EV and how much they expect to pay. And these are things in relation to electric vehicles that um, not much research has really done before. So this is, this is very uh, illuminating when we dug into this. So one question that we ask people is just how much are they willing to pay or do they expect to pay for their next vehicle? Um, you know, there's a healthy percentage here, you know, 27% that expect to pay less than 12,500. It's a great used car market. Um, but what I think is most interesting and important in the context of this conversation is that uh, in the middle here in the bold, 33% said that they'd pay 25,000 to about 45,000. Um, and that's also 40% of those are considered an EV selected this price point. So that's pretty squarely in line with a new electric vehicle. Um, so again, it's, it's interesting that people say cost is a concern about buying an EV, but they're willing to pay this much money for or expect to pay this much money for their next vehicle. And then we ask people when they um, expect to buy their first EV, either new use, and, and I touched on this before, but almost 50% of Coloradans expect to do so within the next five years. So again, how do we get these people to do it maybe even faster than five years? Let's move that to two years, to three years if we can, to really increase that EV adoption curve. Then we also ask people, um, when, whether they anticipate buying whatever their next vehicle is new or used. And, and the sad reality is that there's not a ton of used EVs out there right now. So what we need to do is get new EVs on the road so that those then become used in a faster time frame and get to a broader percentage of Coloradans. Uh, so when we, when we dug into this and particularly people that said they're considering researching EVs, um, they are more likely to purchase new when compared with other groups. But again, this is kind of like people answering in an aspirational way because um, actual sales data don't reflect the fact that, you know, nearly 40% of people think they're gonna buy new vehicles. So, you know, we, we kind of answer surveys the way that we want uh, to perceive ourselves. And so I bring this up because those are some of the key um, factors that went into developing these different Colorado EV consumer segments. and. I'll touch on these just really briefly to give you a background of who these are because they kind of fit into the context of our overarching strategy, or I, I shouldn't say kind of, these are core to our overarching Colorado EV strategy. Um, we developed these EV consumer segments based on all the market research that we got back and um, we call them, uh, I'll actually get into them um, a little bit here. So the first one is the in the, dri in the driver's seat segment. And these are people that most closely represent current EV owners. And uh, in our study, current EV owners could self-identify as such. So these are people that look and act and sort of think similarly to current EV owners. Uh, they just don't own one yet. So these are great near-term target, about 6% of the population, you know, a bit younger. Um, we, you can see here with something we looked at is if they park within 15 feet of electricity source, which is really important for charging at home purposes. So 
very immediate term segment that we should be targeting. Ready to roll is another, is, is sort of the second nearest term um, segment that we need to target. And, and I kind of think of targeting messaging and, and marketing to these two segments together. Um, this is about 15% of Coloradans. And these are people that say they want to buy a new car and plan to get their first EV within five years. So they, they fit those two buckets really nicely. Um, they also are very positive on EVs, are into the environment and are very EV knowledgeable. So the, with these two segments, if we can target them with um, very intentional messaging, addressing some of their key barriers like the lack of knowledge around charging, um, the first costs, uh, the lifestyle elements here, we have a really good chance of moving this market to getting an EV in a faster timeline than the five years they might expect. From here, the, the segments get a little bit farther out and these are more of the um, more of the, the early majority of Coloradans in that diffusion of innovation curve. Um, kicking the tires, they're not quite ready to get there yet. They're going, they're, their next car is gonna be used or, or they're not sure if they'll buy used or new. So um, that alone might not be a great first target to, to get to. And if we're trying to move this market when they're not quite ready to buy an EV, um, that's likely going to be wasted uh, marketing and messaging dollars, but they're great to sort of prime as that next generation of EV buyers. The down the road segment is, um, they're not gonna get one anytime soon. You know, these are the mainstream buyers. And again, if we're trying to target or uh, move the entirety of Colorado to purchase an EV, you're gonna fall on deaf ears a lot of the time. And so not a great use of marketing dollars to target these individuals in the near or even likely midterm. And similarly, it goes for the, uh, the wait, wait, don't sell me segment. Um, not interested in EVs, let's not waste our time trying to reach them right now in these very early stages when the success of the EV market in Colorado isn't necessarily a guaranteed. Um, and same with the last gas. They're just not, the last gas segment is not gonna get an EV anytime soon. They're gonna resist it, resist, resist. I think we all probably know people like this. So again, not an effective use of our time or resources to try to move them to the market. And the reason that I uh, bring these up and show you is because so, so we kind of place them, you know, sum this up and place them on the diffusion of innovation. You can see here on the left hand side, the in the driver's seat and ready to roll are the immediate term markets that we need to try to move and speed up their anticipated timeline to get an EV so that we can start shifting that curve um, more towards the left in the near term. Then the kicking the tires and down the road segments are kind of the next near term segments after we hit these segments. Um, not great to target at the moment, but kind of prime them with messaging to the marketplace, to these first two segments. And then the wait, wait, don't sell me in the last gas segments are ones that will um, likely not make moves on an EV until they have seen all these other segments and um, a healthy chunk of the population driving EVs. They feel comfortable. This is a a functional car and it meets their needs and they have friends and family that have done it and say, yeah, this works. This is a really, um, a really healthy thing for me and for my lifestyle. Uh, and so again, I, I just, I'm not gonna go through this in the interest of time here, um, but I wanted to just bring this back to moving those near-term segments. Um, it, it's actually interesting. I'm in the midst of implementing uh, EV awareness and education campaign for a county in Colorado that is focused on hitting the um, in the driver's seat and ready to roll segments with messaging themes of charging at home is easy, um, charging on the go isn't a mystery. There's electric cars that fit your lifestyle and electric cars are cheaper than you think too. And so we're doing really uh, multi-channel targeted campaigns to try to reach these specific audiences to again, speed up that time frame to uh, purchase an electric vehicle. And so that's an exciting uh, sort of real world implementation of all this work that we did for the energy office. And so I burned through that. <laughs> I know it's a lot of content to cover in a short period of time. Um, I don't know if we have, if we wanna be doing uh, questions, Kent, I know it's a lot, a lot to cover, um, but hopefully that was uh, interesting. And, and maybe even those, like I say, that have an EV or are interested in getting one, some of these issues maybe resonated with you a little bit and maybe even uh, give you a little bit of a different perspective on some of these issues and whether an EV fits your lifestyle. Yeah, super, Adam. I, um, we do have these two follow-up presentations, but I 
Uh, we did have one question early uh, sent to me. So let's see, uh, Dick White, do you wanna unmute yourself and go ahead with your question? Dick is a former mayor and a city councilor and has a, a climate related question for you. Yeah, my, my question was the prompted by your first slide where you know, it was saying, oh, there's just this shortage of information. And that sounds suspiciously like a fallacious argument around climate change. Well, if people only knew, if people really only understood the issue, they would get on board. And that's been shown to be false. The psychologists have told it, no, it's really a basic issue of attitude towards, uh, attitudes towards a whole lot of things and not just the information about climate change. And I'm, so I was prompted to wonder, have you considered this and how much of that uh, informa uh, supposed information lack really lies deeper in people's psyche? Yeah, you, you bring up a really good point um, there. And, and I'll, I think I'll probably partially address your question and probably partially not. Um, but there, we, we can't just sort of information people to death and you know assume that if we give them the right and factual information that it's going to, people are all of a sudden the light's gonna switch and oh yeah, I can't believe I didn't realize that. Um, so much of it has to do with framing in the context of people's lives. It has to come from their trusted sources and circles. Um, it has to be relevant and uh, important and meaningful to them and so, just getting people the information, you're, you're absolutely right, is not gonna do the trick. It has to be done in intentional and meaningful ways to the individual. And that is the challenge. You know, that, that's why I, we often talk about this not being an advertising campaign, but more of a behavioral challenge to get more people in EVs because there are so many multifaceted complex issues in terms of overall communication to actually making that happen. This is a very good point. Adam, thanks. Thank you so much. And Adam, hope you can stick around. We've got these two more local uh, dives and then maybe we'll have a few more questions. Uh, yes, glad to. Um, um, next up, uh, we have the EV readiness plan with the city of Durango and LPEA. So Dominic May is going to be uh, presenting a bit about their EV readiness plan that those two organizations have put together. So uh, Dominic, um, make sure you're unmuted and uh, take it away. Great. Yeah, um, so he's introduced me a little bit. I'm the Energy Resource Program Architect at LPA, and uh, some of these are just the familiar goals you can see there that we've set from LPEA and the city of Durango, uh, projecting out to 2030 and then out to 2050 and beyond uh, for decarbonization. So we can go ahead to the next slide here. Um, those are sort of the, the driving factor behind this and when we created the uh, the work, uh, the community sustainability work group, then the EVs were identified as an early opportunity to break off and do that after we'd won a Colorado Energy Office and DOLA grants uh, to help support that with LPA and City of Drango. Uh, at the high level, our strategy in developing this started with collecting the areas we can target locally, um, as you can see here. And uh, you can actually progress to the next slide here. Um, and these were derived from specific local stakeholders as well as the community at large um, and then those of us developing the plan as well. Uh, so this was the community survey uh, that we had sent out. We also had workshops with the targeted community stakeholders uh, which were hotels etc. Um, and so you can actually go to the next slide. Um, so some of these results I think are exactly what you just heard here. Uh, we, we saw some of the often referenced things that uh, were not too surprising. Um, and then, then we saw a few things that we did not actually completely expect to surface as high ones, uh, range anxiety always near the top as its price. Uh, the lack of charge stations was a good data point for us, for example, um, and may especially require us to revisit some of our targets that are later on in this plan around actual uh, metrics we're gonna try to hit here. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So yeah, then availability, again, uh, the huge one, there's the often referenced in our territory, especially example of the lack of a solid pickup truck that looks like a truck and comes from a big manufacturer that is ideally not politicized quite so much. Um, and then the other thing, uh, tax credit was another interesting thing that came up here and uh, the point of sale rebates. Uh, one of the things I'm really interested in trying to uh, explore for an equity concern and policy is shifting the tax credit to make that a credit for ownership instead of purchasing that might actually help with the used market and enable a lower income bracket to own cars and get that. Um, you can go to the next slide. So we broke our overarching strategy into these kind of five more and more specific categories. 
where those below are always driven or informed by those above. Um, and so at the end, we wanted to wind up with these granular, actionable strategies for each sector that actually were comprehensive of all of these goals, um, sort of in a top-down, forced rank priority status. Uh, you can go ahead to the next slide here. Uh, so when we did our projections, uh, this is kind of the timeline we arrived at for the decarbonization. And I probably should note here that there's a few things we've relabeled uh, to as an LPA employee. Uh, we did have to note that like the ZEV um, legislation and some of these other slices would, could not be realized without a much, much cleaner power supply. So that's a little bit implicit in this, but it tracks that as well. Um, and you can actually go to the next slide. So we are setting pretty aggressive goals based on all this, and we're planning to present the, the plan as a whole form for formal adoption by LPEA, as well as city council in the coming couple of months. Uh, so it'll be forthcoming and you can go to the next slide. Uh, and so when these projections are translated into demand for energy, they're gonna require serious planning on both our parts, LPA, the city, and frankly, a lot of the stakeholders who we've wrapped into this to accommodate uh, both just in terms of infrastructure and then to hit those carbon reduction goals as well. Um, it's a little bit hard to hear, see here, but these are not steady growth rates. There's actually a few inflection points based on population and industry changes that we can already see coming. And right now we're actually tracking well ahead of this projection. So we might revise up to our high adoption scenario, um, which we also developed there. Uh, if you wanna to go to the next slide. So uh, this is another number we can revisit, but it represents best practice in many low EV penetration regions today. We far exceed this right now uh, with closer to one station for every 15 cars. But that data point of too few stations is interesting and we're wanting to delve in there and see how many of those people own cars and that's their experience versus that's their perception. There's, there's things like that. Um, so if you wanna to go to the next slide. Can you explain that one just a touch further? Sorry, yeah, uh, going too super fast. So yeah, that one is uh, basically the, uh, right now there's this uh, established metric of how many charge stations should be available for how many EVs are on the road within your territory. And uh, this one, the target based on this plan for similar places, similar um, cities who've done this metro, uh, metro areas is this one in 50, though I think that is uh, based on what we have currently, we actually have for every 15 EVs on the road, we have one charge station. And uh, we are, we're still seeing that comment that you saw prior from our community survey where some, a large uh, sliver is saying what would keep them from buying an EV is the lack of charge stations. Uh, so that's, that's sort of what I was getting out of diving into that and trying to parse if that really means people are teasing out whether that means EV owners are experiencing a lack of charge stations or non-EV owners are having a perception that there's not enough public charging available. Um, and that's any speed. There was a when Unger just asked that's level two or level three. We don't, I would never consider level one public charging other than airports, honestly, long-term parking. But, uh, but yeah, that would be either speed, not just DC fast charging. Um, so yeah, and then we established basically these criteria uh, for prioritization, and we use these to build out a way to compare um, all the many possible initiatives within each sector. Uh, and then the key stakeholders, such as fleet managers and dealerships uh, who've been involved, have been involved in helping us develop these, and they're going to be a key part of the plan's uh, execution and adoption. Um, we're going to be tracking against goals for every sector and plan to come back on a scheduled basis to iterate on this. Um, and I think that's my last slide. So, but yeah, the plan is gonna be made publicly available for comment in the, couple, in a, the coming couple of months and uh, hopefully publicly adopted as well in the couple, couple a few months. So you should be able to dive in a lot more deeply and see the actual content of the plan. And hopefully this is just kind of a preview. So. Excellent, Thank, thanks so much, Dominic. And again, he's, uh, I don't know your title with LPEA. Could you repeat it for us? Kind of a long title. It's a little yeah. awkward. Energy Resource Program Architect. <laughs> there we go. Right on. Or I'm, sure, I'm sure you, um, I'm hopeful you'll be around for questions that after uh, Lori has a chance to speak here. Sure, sure. absolutely. Um, Lori, Lori Dixon, the Executive Director of Fourcore. Um, do you want to take over the share and, and um, sure. um, fill us in on the regional uh, regional effects and plans of four core. Okay, multiple participants can share simultaneously. I'm trying to share here. 
Um, can can somebody make me shareable? <laughs> I think you should be able to share, Lori, since you are a co-host. Um, so you click on the little green button at the bottom, share screen. Yeah, I'm there and clicking all of them, and it's not allowing me to share. Only host, only participants. So um, there we go. Now it, it, it popped up. There you okay. go. Can you um, see the PDF that's in front here? That looks good. OK, great. Well, um, it was good to hear Adam's presentation. And um, thankfully, we have the organization that provides the education and outreach um, and all kinds of events related to um, the adoption of EVs and promoting the infrastructure in the areas. Um, our region um, is all of Southern Colorado. So we serve from Utah to the Kansas border. Um, like tomorrow, for example, I have an online presentation with La Junta and Otero Community College to talk to them about EV adoption and um, EV infrastructure on their campus. Um, I, I work with six different utilities through this region um, and all of them have different levels of EV um, participation in terms of rebates or um, you know, helping with infrastructure. Some don't have much at all. Um, and others like La Plata Electric, we're very lucky to have um, a pretty advanced um, level of rebates and support for the adoption of EVs. And um, the Colorado Energy Office, and, and I Adam didn't speak too much for the recharge coaches, but we've been providing those kinds of workshops and education that are, you know, reducing things um, and, and reducing anxieties like, like the range anxiety, like he's talking about. So I would encourage everybody who would love to learn more about EVs. We're doing everything from in-person now to um, online presentations, and I have several in the works. Um, uh, just to give you an idea of the recharging stations that we have been directly or indirectly responsible for um, seeing in the area through the what is known as the recharge grant. So that helps um, that helps any sort of business or um, or utility or municipality get grants and, and share in the cost of the installation of EV charging. Um, as you can see, some of the ones that are coming soon, um, Wolf Creek Ski Area, they should have their level two, and um, there are two level twos and one DC fast charge by this spring. Um, same with Telluride Conoco, um, obviously snow dependent and, um, but there's, there are a lot that are in the works right now as far as DC fast charge. It is a little more complex and costs a lot more money, um, but there are grants available for that. These are some of, on the left, are some of the level two stations that are, um, have been installed and have been made available because of the charge ahead grant. Um, if people want to see a little bit more about all the charging across the state, um, one of the websites that almost every EV driver uses is plugshare.com. And um, it gives you an idea of all the charging stations in the region, actually in the world. So, um, and just to note that the next grant round for the Charge Ahead grant so that you could um, get support for installing EV charging stations happens um, and it opens on May 15th. Um, I am happy to assist you with that. I help with you know, your narrative a little bit and, and making sure you're saying the right things. Um, I, can, I can also direct you to the people who are the certified installers in the region. And we have several um, that are great to work with. Um, another great website to look at that you can find out just how many electric vehicles are on the road. It's again through the Colorado Energy Office's website and zero emission, zero emission vehicles and their registration. So through um, vehicle registration, we can determine just how many vehicles are actually on the road. Um, and, and it's a fun interactive website to look at. 
um, I really wanted to make sure you all knew about some of the great events that are coming up. Um, we do have a group by that's uh, occurring from May 1st to June 15th. I'll have all the tax incentives and tax credit information for you. Um, and for the first time, we have Durango Motor Company um, participating in our group by. Previously, it's just been the Chevy Bolt and the Nissan Leaf, but this year we will have the Kia Nero and um, the Mustang Mach-E. So you don't have to call Glenn, especially for <laughs> driving his Ford Mustang, his brand new Ford Mustang EV. You can come to the ride and drive and see that. Um, and we have the ride and drive happening on May 15th at the La Plata County Fairgrounds from one to five. Again, this is a great time to get information. We'll have lots of handouts. We'll have um, hopefully La Plata Electric. We've talked about having them at the event. And um, you can see how some of the charging works and um, we'll just have a lot of vehicle information. It's a great way to see a whole bunch of vehicles at one time. Um, the reason I have pictured this shuttle van up here is we're pretty excited to <clears throat> have Lightning E-Motors visit us. And they are a Loveland-based company um, producing electric vehicles. Their most recent one is all the DHL delivery trucks in New York City. Um, they're bringing two medium duty electric vehicles, um, probably a transit van, maybe a box truck. We're not exactly sure which vehicles. And that's gonna happen um, on Wednesday, June 2nd. I sort of stress that that is um, going to be an event focused largely on fleet managers. Um, however, the interested public is, is welcome to join us. Um, the times are still to be determined. Um, I think that's the last slide I had. So if you have um, anybody you'd like me to, to speak to about um, getting an EV charging station installed at their business or, um, or you want some kind of presentation to a group, we do dozens of those. That's, uh, that's our deliverables for the Colorado Energy Office. So we'd like, to, um, we'd like to reduce that range anxiety and answer your questions through any kind of, um, kind of presentation that we could give to your group or um, organization, so. Super, Lori, thank you so much. I, if, they, if folks have a question, you can raise your hand on the far right on the bottom in Zoom. There's reactions. Go up there, raise your hand. Uh, if anyone has a question, we can go with that. Otherwise, uh, um, we do, uh, do want to have a huge uh, thanks to Adam Maxwell, Dominic May from La Plata Electric, and uh, Lori Dixon from Fourcore. Um, and I think there is another question. Uh, uh, Dick White, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Yeah, I have another question for Adam. Uh, this motivated, uh, I have a in-law in Mesa, Arizona, who was thinking about uh, buying an EV, but found out they'd need an extra 220 line to the house and just got completely shut down by it. And, um, you know, they're retired, but, you know, Phoenix is a very big metropolitan area. I was there a few weeks ago and drove 100 miles round trip to play golf. So I think, uh, you know, being able to do it only for a fraction of your trips probably isn't sufficient motivation for that kind of investment. Yeah, another really interesting point. That, that's kind of one of the unfortunate circumstances that arise sometimes when people dig into finding one or even figuring out how to set up charging at their home. Um, electric vehicles are not for everyone and they're not for every use case and scenario too. And I think that uh, that's a message that needs to be portrayed in the marketplace. You know, if we're trying to discuss EVs as your do it all, you know, long distance cross country car, um, I don't know that we're really setting the right expectation for people. You know, granted, I've heard plenty of stories of Tesla, you know, people in Tesla's doing that and they have a much more robust charging network set up across the country than any other um, entity does. But, you know, for those long distance trips, EVs aren't, aren't right for it. And I think that's okay to admit. And that's a good thing to discuss. I think what we, a good framing in that context is they're not great now, but in the coming years, as more manufacturers are building more models and battery range increases, they might be more feasible and realistic for those trips and a better use case for those. But right now, yeah, that, that's why I'm having sort of a, 
a towny car for your electric car or an electric car for your kind of town oriented car and a nice car for longer trips is, is a plenty healthy way to go. You know, if we could get people doing the majority of their trips, which oftentimes are the majority of us, you know, around town type of work, I, I think that's a big win. Um, so yeah, I, you, you, totally valid point. Super, thanks, Adam. Uh, Stevens Parker, you had a question. Go ahead and unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi, hi guys. And um, I'm a two and a half week owner of a Tesla Model Y. And um, I haven't found any problem with charging stations. I charged up in Poncha Springs on my way home from Denver. I charged up in uh, Grand Junction uh, this past weekend. And uh, uh, Tesla's got it, got it figured out with that network, but Rivian's not far behind, is not far behind. I read that they just inked a deal with Colorado Parks and Wildlife to put in uh, charging stations and all the, uh, all the uh, uh, state parks. So um, uh, I'm, I'm all in, uh, and I'm glad we're uh, moving in that direction. Thanks. Um, Thank you. I, Lori, wanted, you I wanted to mention that about the state parks. Yeah, Rivian has signed a deal, so there'll be two level two chargers at every state park in Colorado by the end of the summer, according to their plan anyway. And Rivian also has um, another pretty extensive program as far as charging infrastructure around the country, not just in Colorado, but that deal has been signed by Colorado Parks and Wildlife, so. Super. Uh, let's see, I think maybe we do have another question or two. Um, Amy Grogan, you had a question, go ahead and unmute. Yeah, so I looked at buying um, an EV a couple of years ago and I was looking to buy a vehicle and I was told you had to replace all the batteries in five years, thereby you had to buy a brand new EV all over again. So that just cut it out, I couldn't afford that because it's so much wear and tear on those batteries. You have to completely replace all the batteries. Is that I, I is have EV still drivers. True? I have EV drivers that are used EV drivers, um, and they're still driving 2013 Nissan Leafs and have not gone through that. So, and, yeah, there. But there are um, there are issues about degradation, but that I, I, I'm, that's not a hard fast rule. Okay, so maybe that was bad uh, info I got from the car dealer. Yeah, and that, that's, I, I think that, you know, there's plenty of misinformation out there or misperceptions out there. And um, it's interesting, we've had some conversations with car dealers and uh, they don't, they're not always, you know, privy to the most um, factual information either. And so they discuss what they hear about things and there's often a disincentive for them to sell electric cars right now. So. Yeah, I think just one of those unfortunate, um, not entirely accurate pieces of information. So you would not agree with that, that you have to replace your batteries? No, I, I would not. Um, I, you know, echoing Lori, I have a few, a few colleagues even that have uh, 2013 Nissan Leafs that are still going strong. So I, I think yeah. that's one of, just one of those unfortunate um, pieces of information that gets out there that may not be entirely accurate. Okay, thank you. Sure. You know what I, I'd okay. like to add? Um, we need to wrap it up here. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I just wanted to add something about our regional dealerships. Um, one of the things we do is we provide education to actually the sales team at dealerships. And what I do find is because the sales team changes and changes frequently, it's something we have to do at least once a year um, because not all the sales staff really understands um, electric vehicle operations and um, I, uh, yeah, it, it is an issue, but that's part of the education process that we do as far as getting dealerships on board um, and especially their sales staff. So they have a better understanding of, um, of electric vehicles, so. Great point, Lori, thanks so much. Okay, uh, Susan with San Juan Citizens Alliance, um, you've got an announcement. I think. 
Oh, you're muted. There, now Thank you're you. good. Thanks, Adam, Lori, and um, Dominic. That was awesome. Um, I just wanted to quick um, let everyone know that SJCA is going to be doing monthly um, program update meetings from our staff uh, beginning next week on Thursday, the 22nd at um, at 5 p.m. And Marcel Gaztamada, our Animus River Keeper, is going to be talking about um, Animus River issues. And it's basically just going to be a quick update from Marcel, but more to um, for everybody, our supporters and members, to just have an open discussion and ask questions and talk about the Animus River. So that's it. Great. That That's uh, May, April 22nd. Yep. Super, thank you, Susan. And I uh, wanna thank everyone for joining a virtual GBR. Special thanks to Sandia Tillotson of Sagebrush for helping facilitate us going online. And uh, we wanna thank our sponsor again. Uh, uh, and I lost the slide. Oh, well, it went away. <laughs> um, Susan, can you help me out there with the uh, sponsor for Southwest. For Southwest Bank. For Southwest Bank. Thank, thanks to them for a sponsorship. And uh, as we wrap up here, we want to invite you to uh, join a small group discussion. Um, we're going to divide into groups of like four or five people. Just turn on your microphone, introduce yourself, share a takeaway, and say goodbye to your friends. We'll look forward to seeing you again in the, uh, the fall. And please send us any topic ideas for GBR. Um, so if you just sit tight, you'll magically vaporize into a group of five, and that will wrap us up for the season. Uh, thank you, and we'll see you uh, maybe on the river or at the EV charging station or downtown. Hey Ross, hi Sam. You see a little pop-up that you can join the breakout room? Hi, Douglas. You are welcome to leave the meeting if you wish, or I can put you in a breakout room if you wish. Hi, Susan. I think I just moved you to another room uh, since some of your people left. I wasn't sure. Um, I wasn't sure because I was the only one in the room. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It looks like Ross froze. You had some people with you to start, right? And then did they leave? Mm -hmm. Were you able to say hello at all, or did I everyone? As I was saying hello, um, Cheryl left. I said hello, Cheryl, hello, Doug, and then um, Doug left. Right oh, now. okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, we have a couple, let's see, one, two, we have three rooms open with about four people each. That's okay, uh, yeah. Probably, I, can, I think I can just hang here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, have you been busy? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've been busy and I was able to visit some some family in California. So that was nice to finally see people after so long. Yeah. And I'm sorry to hear about your mom. Thank That's you. Really hard. 
Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, just it, I got back two and three weeks ago. So okay. it's like, yeah, just trying to <laughs> just getting yeah. back into things, but it's, um, been real. My, my dad was with me the first week and then, oh, okay. um, but it's been really, you know, just having other things to focus on and just going back to, you know, work and, I'm sure that helps. That helps yeah, it does. Lot. Yeah, it does. Cause it was a hundred percent. Like I, I, I haven't ever experienced anything like that before a situation mm. like that. So mm. it was, um, I don't I'm really, really, really grateful that I was, you know, I, I'm grateful for it. Definitely. Yeah. So, yeah. But it's so nice. Like seeing your, you guys's face and just like, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, just being back at SJCA and some of the people here in Durango. I was in Florida, so it was like right. this is my home. <laughs> so right. it was so right. I'm happy. You were that. gone for a couple of months, right? I was gone. Um, yeah, um, from December 31st, and I got back on the 21st of March. Oh so. wow! Mm -hmm. Wow, like three months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what? yeah. But, wow. Yeah, but doing better, doing, good. <laughs> doing good, you know. That's good. It's yeah. quite a process, I'm sure. Oh yeah. Yep. I'm yeah. glad you're able to focus on some other things too, and be back at home and feel For like sure. you're back part of the community. Yes. So I know yeah. we missed you. It's like where's Susan? Like it she's is, I, on her team. I know. I know. I know. And, and yeah. Katie, Katie was great. Katie was great too. Um, to have her step in, but I still missed you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I missed you too. Yeah, it was so good. And then seeing everybody's names up on GPR was awesome to, I'm like, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Welcome back, Lori. Yeah, I'm headed out. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Okay. Thanks, Lori. Thanks for organizing it. Oh, Lori, I wanted to tell you really quickly um, that uh, that my cousin works at Rivian. He's um, one of the like upper managers at Rivian or something. So if you ever need another contact there, just let me know. Yeah, um, it's interesting because I, I, I literally while we were on the call, I just got a um, I just got an email. A, a colleague of mine, we've worked in the e the recharge program. Now he's off doing other things. I'm in talks with Rivian on EV station development. So. Um, that's a, uh, that's a really big thing right now and all the development that they're doing, but he's setting up the network of electricians. Dominic, I'll send his name to you. You might even know um, Matthew Smigelski. Do you remember him? Um, Sorry, I, I just rejoined. I don't know what we're talking about. Oh, okay. Well, Rivian, um, and he's asking for good EV power supply contacts at LDA and San Isabel and Empire. And, oh, yeah. and anyway, um, He's, he's working with the Rivian um, station development. So definitely uh, that'd be great around the area. So you may be getting uh, you may be getting an email with his contact information. Sounds Cause good. you're the LPA guy I'd send him to. <laughs> Sounds right. <laughs> great. All right. Well, thanks so much everyone for uh, spending some time in the breakout rooms. We hope you had a, a great little visit with folks. Um, GBR is complete. Let's give Kent a round of applause for doing Thank a great you, job. Kent. You survived. You First survived the worst year of... of GBR. Yeah. Have a beautiful afternoon, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.